Hello and welcome. My name is Professor Jackie Blissett. I'm the co-director of Aston Institute of Health and Neurodevelopment, whose research is focused on answering the questions that matter to children, families and the services that support them. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the first of our public lecture series on the theme of Molecules to Minds. And in this session, we'll, we'll hear from Dr. Rachel Shaw and her colleagues from Birmingham Children's Hospital Paediatric Intensive Care Unit about the SWELL project. The SWELL project is a partnership between Aston University and Birmingham Women and Children's NHS Foundation Trust to prioritise workplace wellbeing for those people working in paediatric intensive care. Dr. Rachel Shaw is a health psychologist. She specializes in qualitative research and developing interventions in clinical practice. Rachel's the chief investigator on the SWELL project. And we're also really lucky to be joined for discussion by Rachel Morrison, an advanced nurse practitioner and co-lead of the Pediatric Critical Care Society Wellbeing Specialist Interest Group. Rachel is the principal investigator at Birmingham Children's Hospital. We also have Sarah Webb, who's an advanced nurse practitioner at a Pediatric Intensive Care Unit at Birmingham Children's Hospital, and Dr. Heather Duncan, a consultant intensivist at the same unit. We'll be taking questions at the end of Rachel's lecture in the discussion, so people can post questions and comments in the comments uh, section while Rachel is presenting. So without further ado, it's over to Rachel to hear more about this project. Thanks, Jackie. Hello, and welcome to the SWELL project. So we're interested in the SWELL project in understanding and improving staff wellbeing. And as Jackie said, this project is focused at Birmingham Children's Hospital, and we're working together with them to help improve staff wellbeing in paediatric intensive care. So we know from the NHS staff survey that stress among people, work-related stress among people working in the NHS hospital trust around the country is pretty high at a 44%. Um, whilst around a third of staff feel like the, the trusts are doing something to improve their well-being, it's clearly still a problem that needs to be tackled. And from research from Gillian Colville, we can see that burnout and post-traumatic stress are really high among paediatric intensive care as well. There's around 17% um, I think of um, people um, experiencing burnout and around 13% of people experiencing post-traumatic stress and that's the symptoms of post-traumatic stress, not necessarily a clinical disorder um, but clearly a really important problem. We know that coping strategies are varied, some successful, some otherwise. Burnout and post-traumatic stress can be decreased and have been associated with um, debriefing um, following traumatic events in hospital, uh, talking to senior colleagues and engaging in hobbies outside of work. And again, this is um, from Gillian Colville's research. And interestingly, she also found that burnout can be increased by simply venting one's emotions. And I think that's the venting without um, any supportive framework around it. Um, and alcohol use can double the risk of burnout. So we know that there are some quite unhealthy coping strategies around as well. So we know what the problem is. We have stress, we have moral distress, post-traumatic stress symptoms and burnout. And they were already high way before the pandemic hit, but we know that the pandemic has made these things worse. Um, it's, a, it's a problem that needs to be tackled. And I think one of the few benefits to have come out of the pandemic is that it's really um, come onto people's agenda as something we need to, to look at. And so in the SWELL project, we wanted to really focus on solving the problem. There have been many, many studies describing these pathologies, but not very much at all looking at how to solve the problem. So that's where we focused with the SWELL project. It's based at Paediatric Intensive Care Unit at Birmingham Children's Hospital. This is one of the largest 
pediatric intensive care units in the country with a 30 with 31 beds. It's a major trauma centre for the region, for the West Midlands, which means many patients come from far and wide um, around the country. Um, unlike some units, it does have cardiac as well as liver, respiratory and neurosurgery. There's also the kids um, team, which is the intensive care retrieval service, which again goes out to those areas that might not be covered. Um, and has a large staff group of around about 250 members of staff. So this is our team. Um, this project was funded by Birmingham Women's and Children's um, Pediatric Intensive Care Charities. So many, many thanks to them for funding this work. I'm the academic lead for the project as chief investigator. We had Isabel Butcher as project manager Work, working wonders on the project and being the most efficient person I think I've ever worked with. Um, and we have two research assistants involved, Bola Balogun, who is now a final year student at Aston doing psychology, and Ezra Yito is about to join us to do some more work, um, who's a recent graduate of MSc Health Psychology at Aston. And you'll see our, you've seen our clinical team, um, and you'll be seeing them again a little bit later. We have Rachel Morrison, Sarah Webb, both of whom are advanced nurse practitioners, and Heather Duncan, a consultant intensivist. So the project was split into three work streams. The first was we wanted to really look at what is currently happening in the unit to improve staff wellbeing. We know, well, I knew from many years of collaborating with Birmingham Children's Hospital previously that the staff are really highly committed um, to boosting their own well-being and to supporting each other. Um, so we knew that there was a lot going on on the unit. We just didn't really know exactly what. So that was our first task was to explore current activity to see what actually is happening. Um, then we looked at well-being. So well-being, it's now a term that's used far and wide. Um, staff well-being has become one of the top priorities for a lot of organisations, um, especially since the pandemic. But it's, it can be quite a nebulous concept and it means something different to each person. And so we really wanted to look at what does well-being mean to the staff that we're dealing with. And then the third strand of work was really delving deep into what challenged staff's well-being at work. Um, so really focusing in on those kinds of challenges, which might happen to them in their personal life, but also the challenges to their um, well-being whilst at work. So the things that were particularly unique to the um, paediatric intensive care unit context. And so our first task of auditing well-being activities showed that SPIC staff are doing a lot um, to boost their own well-being. Um, and they're working in lots and lots of different ways. Um, many of these kinds of initiatives to improve well-being pre-existed um, you know, the, the pandemic. Quite a few of them were introduced during the pandemic. And some we hope will be maintained um, over a longer period of time. So we, we looked at all of these different initiatives, 40 different initiatives were identified and we categorised them into three groups of kind of informal kinds of activities, um, more formal training programmes and structural interventions. We then um, did some health psychology magic where we looked at what were the active ingredients of those um, initiatives and I'll talk through that a little bit more in a minute. And with the intention being that doing all of this work would help us look at what are the likely successful factors within um, interventions to improve staff wellbeing. So these are all the um, different initiatives that we identified. And the ones that we coded, well, we coded all of them, but the ones that were coded to have identified the most um, psychologically um, theoretical components were those that have just appeared in red. So these were the interventions that were more formalised. Um, they had clearly been developed um, with, the, with the evidence in mind 
and they clearly had those kinds of active ingredients that we know are likely to be successful. So these were those active ingredients. We call them behavior change techniques. Uh, Susan Mickey's Center for Behavior Change at UCL developed this behavior change taxonomy a number of years ago. It's based on a number of um, reviews of the literature, which has identified what kinds of techniques are likely to be successful in different kinds of environments in behavior change interventions. And essentially, if we're developing a behavior chain, if we're developing a well-being intervention, something that we hope will boost staff well-being, essentially we're wanting them to change their behavior in some way. And so these were really important to, to identify them, to look at the, the evidence inside um, the existing interventions and to look forward at what might be the most successful. And if you can see on the screen, they're perhaps not entirely surprising. Um, so social support was really key to a lot of these initiatives. Goals and planning may be a little bit more surprising, but that's really where prioritizing well-being is uh, becomes um, a key objective of the intervention. And so that's by thinking about what well-being is and making goals and plans as to how to make that happen. So trying to think about what is well-being for you and planning, specifically planning when you're going to get to that place so that you can you can feel that boost of well-being. Self-belief was found to be a really key ingredient in these um, initiatives. And that's related to self-efficacy. So that's one's, uh, one's confidence in one's ability to do something. Um, we all know from our own experience, you know, when we're feeling a little low, perhaps when we're feeling under pressure, our self-confidence also kind of falls through the floor. Um, and so it's not surprising, again, that the initiatives um, that, that staff had developed to boost well-being involved boosting that self-belief as well. <clears throat> Feedback and monitoring are important because that's really about noticing um, what you're doing, noticing a difference in the way that you're feeling so that you can then begin to recognize as you go forward what it is that makes you feel better and what it is that makes you feel challenged. So that then you can focus on those things that make you feel better um, and, and try to take a more... Um, mindful approach um, to working on your own well-being and shaping knowledge and so this is about helping people develop strategies to boost their well-being to develop their knowledge in that way it might also be helping to shape knowledge in relation to um, seeking support so accepting that vulnerability is a thing that exists and it's not something that should be hidden but it's something that, that we really need to acknowledge and that in order to learn from that and to take it forward into the, into our future practice and so those are the things that we think are likely to be successful um, and clearly are currently um, in use on the unit already so support um, is important from a number of different places, whether that's formalized support from psychologists or more informal peer support, prioritizing and planning um, well-being conducive activities, so really making space for those things to happen, monitoring and feeding back, so making sure the conversations are had, boosting one's confidence at work and training to build staff confidence. Um, and especially in those non-clinical areas, like communicating with parents, for example. So our second piece of work then really focused on what is the meaning of well-being. And as I said at the beginning, this is a really quite an abstract concept. Um, when you start to think, well, actually, what is well-being to me? It's, it's difficult to put your finger on it. And we know that putting things into words can be really tricky. And so we used a method called appreciative inquiry, which has a kind of um, a dream function where we kind of dream and imagine what, what, what well-being might mean to us. And we further prompted that by showing people a series of pictures. So you can see some of those images on the screen. And what we asked of staff 
was um, to highlight just any one of those images, if that felt like it represented well-being to them. And then that stimulated a conversation about why that represented well-being, what it was that made them feel that sense of um, contentment or peace, um, and really explored that with them. And our researchers, Isabel and Bola, as well as Rachel and Sarah on the unit, collected these data from a really great number of staff on the unit, which was really fantastic. We've had such amazing participation from, from colleagues, which just shows how important this is to them. So I just wanted to give you a little glimpse um, about what the meanings of well-being were for the members of staff that, that we interviewed in this um, second work stream. And you can see the themes there, which we kind of um, described as prerequisites for well-being. So the, the things that need to exist in order for one to, to feel good, to have that sense of well-being. And so the themes were being nurtured and supported at work. And that included being listened to or feeling like, like one is being listened to um, and feeling in control. The second theme was the importance of nature. And we know from growing areas of research that being in green and blue spaces, being outside in the outdoors really does boost people's well-being. And we found that um, being active, so people were describing not just being outside, but being active boosted their well-being. But then for others, it was just a sense of peace, of being in the moment. Um, and really taking in, um, being mindful of, of how it feels to be outside. And social support um, was also identified, and that social support, particularly independent of work in this case. Um, so we saw in the first theme around being supported at work, but that support network outside of work was also really important to people. Um, so spending time particularly with family and friends. And I've just got some examples here. So these were the images that were chosen the most. Um, and you can see there's kind of leaps for joy and um, outdoor spaces and a really nice kind of nurturing image. So I just wanted to take you through just a few of those images to, to give you a sense of what people felt. Um, and so this image really represented a, that sense of nurturing that, that staff experienced at work. Um, some, somebody said it's like a growth, you can feel the personal development and it's out of that personal development that one feels a sense of well-being. And for somebody else, it represented the team having a sense of literally holding them in their hands. And so this was a really good image to, to represent that real sense of, of support that people felt from their colleagues at work. So here we have this beautiful sunny woodland picture, um, which is somewhere I'd probably like to be right now, to be honest, <laughs> um, breathing in the fresh air and taking in the trees. And it was really around um, some people talk, this person talked about feeling the solitude, really um, the well-being came from that being outdoors, being alone, being in nature. Um, for others, we can see the trees, the feel of just being free in the midst of nature, making them making feel happy. And perhaps also a kind of a, a connection to something bigger. Um, so maybe something around escaping into nature, feeling a detachment from the workplace. Um, and perhaps, yes, that more kind of connection to, to something bigger. And here we have a lovely image of a lovely laughing toddler, which for one of our participants really represented a sense of joy um, and represented the feeling of well-being experience when spending time with their own children. Um, spending time with loved ones was something that was raised on a number of occasions by a number of, of colleagues working in paediatric intensive care as uh, from many of the rest of us, I'm sure, as well. 
So we know, therefore, what well-being means to staff. And we know from the literature that this really resonates um, with what other people's research has found as well. Um, so that sense of um, feeling valued and being listened to, having that support um, and feeling of being nurtured at work was really important. Being in nature, um, taking time to be outside and spending time with family and friends. So as I say, you know, it's not rocket science, um, but unfortunately, you know, lots of the time, these really quite simple things can be overlooked. And this really brought home a really clear message that we need to pay attention to this and we need to give our staff opportunities um, to experience well-being. And the final part of the project was delving deep into staff's experiences, um, particularly quite um, critical experiences that had challenged their well-being. And we asked people to talk about things that might have challenged their well-being at work, but also things at home, outside of work life. Because we know that you know, we can cope with a certain amount of stress coming from a certain place, um, so, for example, being stressed at work, we can kind of manage with so long as everything is OK at home. But if things are also um, quite challenging at home, then that can also be, be difficult. Um, and it's that kind of cumulative effect that can really challenge um, staff's sense of well-being. And so we, we gathered lots of stories from lots of staff. You can see we had 53 people participate in this section of the research um, with a really good spread across the different clinical groups working on the unit in Birmingham. Um, and the numbers that you see are quite representative or proportional rather, I, sh I should say, to the numbers of staff in those different working groups. So you can see there are more band five nurses, for example, than others. Um, so we were really delighted that people took the time out to take part um, in this element of our research. And I think some of the clinicians that took part really quite surprised themselves. And they talked for quite lengthy periods um, and really felt um, that that did them some good. So um, talking about their well-being uh, um, and airing these, these feelings really, really helped them as well. So I've just got a few examples um, to talk through. As you can imagine, there was a lot of data. We've been speaking to the, the managers at the unit in Birmingham, as well as to the trust. So we have a whole set of recommendations for them. But this is just to give you a bit of an idea of some of the topics that were raised. So the ageing workforce was one. And this really relates to shift work, shift work becoming more challenging as one ages and particularly working night shifts. So recovering from night shifts gets harder as we age. And of course, well, usually as you're aging, you're also becoming more experienced. And so it was really on people's wish list for things that, that might be changed um, as a result of this work was to really think about the longer term planning in relation to shift work so that we can um, take advantage of the expertise in the clinical team, but also work through shift patterns so that we can give those um, younger, often more um, less experienced staff um, opportunities to grow as well so that we're, we're finding a balance um, in order to help those um, those in the older sectors of the workforce to plan their time in a way that suits their capacity best. And so we have one um, extract here from a medical practitioner on the unit. As you get older, you get punished for not getting enough sleep. On call affects your mood. You can get low moods. Your mood is not good. And I felt like I get angry more easily. And then sorts of things because you're just tired, your bucket fills up more quickly when you're tired. And part of being a clinician 
um, is working as a team, as I've talked about earlier, but also when things happen in a clinical high pressure environment like pediatric intensive care, sometimes things can go wrong. Things don't perhaps always go to plan. Um, and these need to be investigated. So these could be a range of, of things related to patient care. It might be that there's been an error in medication. It, that may have caused no harm at all. It may have caused um, minor harm or been more severe. Um, it might be a grievance that's been reported to HR. It could be something involving the professions council, so perhaps the General Medical Council or the Royal College of Nursing. So a whole range of different things that people may have to deal with. And not surprisingly, these can be experienced as quite significant challenges to one's well-being. And so the things that were helpful, however, to people in these challenging situations was the support that was provided by their senior colleagues. When people felt able to share their experiences with their colleagues, they, they were able to deal with those challenges better. Um, and so really, this, the wish list in, in this area comes down to having more transparent processes, having resources available so that once a person finds themselves in this kind of situation, they know what the process is um, and the, um, th those kind of difficulties of not knowing the process can be overcome that way. And so here we have an extract from, from one of the nursing team. If the person investigating wasn't so supportive, it could have made it quite a different experience. But in my experience, it was, a po it was positive. I felt well supported. And we can see some of the members of the team there on that photo. And it's also important to think about psychological safety um, in any team, but particularly in a team where we're working with life and death. Um, and so, here we, we see a couple of extracts that show that there is a feeling of psychological safety on the unit. There is a sense of support. And so we, we see here that PIC is described as a place that gives you a real psychological safety because you feel you can say what you think. You won't be judged for making comments. And we're, you know, we're included. And that's our senior lead, leadership team, both the nursing and the medical directors. And so it's having that feeling of trust, being able to have open conversations that really does support well-being. And when those things are lacking, it can, it can make things particularly difficult for staff. And here we have an extract um, from somebody, um, oh, I can't see the bottom, it's chopped off my screen. <laughs> so thinking about um, the the changes in the way that working with patients has made staff feel challenged in more complex ways. So we're now seeing in PIC um, more complex chronic cases, which previously may have been more acute, but thankfully children are surviving better for longer. However, this means relationships between staff and their patients uh, are changed. They can be more long-standing relationships which changes the way that staff feel. They may develop a, a, a kind of bond with their patients and their families. And of course, in pediatric intensive care, staff are not just dealing with the patients. In fact, they're usually dealing with parents who are going through their own stresses and challenges as well. So the, the, the possibility of moral distress, feeling unable to do what one wants to, is really clear in that extract there. And of course, to, ha to have a good sense of well-being, we all need to be well fed and watered um, and well sheltered as well. And so there were lots of comments, as you can probably imagine, um, around the facilities. Um, sometimes they were felt to be not quite adequate. There were some noisy spaces. Um, there was a, a feeling of a lack of a quiet space. And so on the wish list here, we have people wishing for perhaps more comfortable um, chairs and seating, tables and chairs to sit and eat at, but also different kinds of spaces for when people need rest and need sleep.
as well. So we know from this work um, on the SWELL project, what helps and what hinders well-being. Some of these things are relatively simple to fix. Um, and just this week, we've seen that the provision of hot food around the clock um, can be possible with just you know pulling some strings and working together with staff on the unit. Um, there was a real sense of um, a, a kind of a lack of, of food being available, especially on night shifts. And so just changing that makes staff feel more valued. Some things are more difficult and they require support from the trust. Some might need um, further investigation and indeed more evaluative work. And that's really where we want to move our focus now. So we know that in, in many ways, what, what we've found here isn't particularly new. <laughs> it resonates really strongly with existing psychological theory. And um, organizations like the General Medical Council, for example, are taking on theories like this, the ABC of well-being. So having that sense of autonomy, feeling like you're in control, a sense of belonging, that real close sense of teamwork and nurturing that we that we found, and that competence. So that self-belief, boosting one's self-efficacy, really, really important. So these are the three key ingredients to, to boosting staff well-being. And whilst it's not especially new, we're really proud of, of the data that we've generated and the really in-depth accounts that staff from Birmingham Children's Hospital have given us. Um, and it's it's been really great working with the people at, at the Children's Hospital on this SWELL project. So what's next? Um, we know from our work what's likely to work um, in terms of those behaviour change techniques, those active ingredients. We know what well-being means to staff and that is, is supported by existing evidence elsewhere. And we know what helps and hinders their well-being. And so we want to do more of the helping and less of the hindering. So our next tranche of work will be looking to evaluate. Um, we need to test the feasibility and acceptability of well-being interventions. And whilst I mentioned how enthusiastic and committed the staff are, on the paediatric intensive care unit at Birmingham, there's the kind of lack of patience to get things done sometimes means that the um, arduous tasks of evaluating don't happen. So that's where myself and my other academic colleagues come in to say, right, we need some structured measures here um, to really do some good quality research to identify what would make these interventions feasible, what would make them acceptable to staff on the unit. And of course, our key outcome measure will be staff's psychological um, well-being. So what it is that looking before and after that might improve staff well-being on those psychological measures. And we've taken this idea really from Julie Highfield's work from the Intensive Care Society. We're really in tune with, with what she's said. And this is a kind of hierarchy, a pyramid of well-being, if you like, to so hark back to, to Maslow. Um, and in the bottom there, we can see what we need to do is really build a foundation of well-being. And that's where those structural interventions come in the things that might offer more formalised training as a matter of course, to give staff um, the time to be able to do that, to run through simulations in order to really get to experience those challenges firsthand. And in the middle there, we have those supportive systems, which are so important, um, which might involve more substantive interventions. They might involve those informal activities as well. And it's important that we have all of those things happening at the same time so that the well-being um, is being, atta being attacked. That's the wrong word. <laughs> We're looking at well-being in lots of different ways, both formal and informal. 
And then at the top, for those who might need it, what we have to have in place is some, some psychological support, support that comes from trained um, clinical or health psychologists who are able to work with staff individually or in groups in order to, um, to help them work through those experiences that might be particularly challenging to their well-being. And so what we're wondering about at the moment is whether it might be possible to take a stepped approach to well-being. So what we found was really interesting was that exploring the topic of well-being feels a little bit like an intervention in itself. And this speaks to self-affirmation principles from the psychological literature. So talking about one's well-being can boost well-being. And so it's having that exercise, perhaps showing people those images on a, you know, a, a, on a random basis and asking them what it is that makes the that feels like well-being to them. But then doing something more formal in step two, perhaps having specific conversations with members of staff and developing with them a wellness plan. So putting in place that goal planning and action planning that we saw was a really key active ingredient. And then it might be that we'll be able to recommend that this would be a really helpful thing to integrate into the professional reviews that happen amongst medical and nursing staff. So we're going to pilot those wellness plans together with a social prescribing package um, and watch this space and we'll, we'll see what happens. So we've been speaking to a number of interested parties. We really do want to make real impact with this work. And so um, watch out for, for future news of how things develop. And of course, we'll be looking for some more funding as well. So if you know anybody, um, a philanthropist who has a lot of money, just let me know. Um, and so finally, thank you for listening. Thanks so much to Birmingham Women's and Children's um, staff for taking part in our research. Without them, it just wouldn't happen. Um, and we really want to make the difference for them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. That was a fascinating insight into the excellent research uh, being carried out in the SWELL project. So now we're going to be joined by uh, Rachel Morrison, Sarah Webb and Heather Duncan to discuss some uh, key questions that have come out of the project. So I think the first question was going to be what was the most surprising thing you learned about your own well-being during this project? So um, for me, definitely it was um, that just by having a conversation about well-being, that you could actually really understand what well-being means um, to me as an individual um, and that um, that is part of the intervention. So sometimes we're looking for quite sort of um, uh, complex interventions, but, but really it can be as simple as having a conversation um doing the um well-being cards um and um and so and, and many of the other interventions actually were not that expensive we didn't we don't actually need that much in the way of resources what we do need is the knowledge and understanding of of what well-being means to us and um and then taking that conversation forward um so that's that was really surprising to me to discover Thanks, Heather. Any any other comments from any of the other speakers? I think that links with the second question quite nicely, actually, which was um, what were the quick wins for the Swell project and the the basic needs, the um, feeding people. You know, that was actually quite a quick win. You know, providing the the food and like an honesty box for that. That was quite a quick win and a quick fix. So not everything has to be so so huge. There are some big things that need further investigation and intervention. But the quick wins were the people need feeding, people need food and water. This is a basic thing. And rest. Let's do it and rest. Mm -hmm. Let's provide a space for people. But you know these are the basic basic human needs. So that was a quick win. And like you said, the cards 
actually that became a, a the appreciative inquiry became a well-being exercise in itself and that was a quick win that actually is fairly transferable many staff can just do that actually that's brilliant so if if you could do one thing to improve staff well-being what would what would that be is there one one thing that has uh, come out of the project so far what what would that be if you had your magic wand i think for me it's about doing one thing on every level so i think um back in a few years ago everyone had to be resilient and there was a million resilient workshops and it's a bit like um one of our psychologists always likens it to the canaries they took down the mines and you just had to make a better canary that would deal with the toxic gases. And then we went very much that paternal, oh, no, we need to do everything for you. Um, but actually what I think what we've learned, you need something on every level. So I think on that massive organisational level, I'd go as far as the country and the government and there has to be the right resources put into things. So somebody that really resonated with me described it as the dancing in the blitz so they were saying like in the blitz in the war you put on these dances to keep everyone happy and that was good and good for their well-being but you still have to solve the war so there's a definite thing at societal level about the right resources being in there in the nhs and then i think when you come down to organization a big thing is those layers which um rachel referred to in her talk um, I think previously what we learned in our organisation, we went very much for the top layer. So we had counselling in place and you could go off and get counselling. But why are we waiting for people to be broken before we start doing stuff? And actually what we found in our experience, people didn't go because they hadn't made relationships. So by putting someone in place that's responsible for it, and I think Michael West talks about this a while ago in one of his reports, somebody has to have responsibility for that and almost do those first two layers to make the relationships so that people can engage and then i think on a personal level you have to plan for your well-being and plan how you notice it and um i started asking this question in pd in our performance reviews how will i know if you're stressed and actually even at senior level people couldn't articulate that so just encouraging people to notice it i'm a huge fan of um the steve peters chimp stuff which Heather introduced me to. And so that's a model, there's many models. That's my model that helps me notice my behaviours. And I think having a plan of what keeps that you or your chimp happy yeah. that you do every day. And then what will you do in crisis? Because there's no way when you're in crisis that you can start to plan your own well-being. then. So you really have to think. And I thought Rachel's sound um, made it quite clear. You have to think and it has to be quite specific of what you would do. Because if you're quite general, from what I've learned, you probably won't do it. Thanks, Rachel. That's that that's that's fascinating. And and I think what what really struck me as 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 you were presenting, Rachel, was, um, and uh, this is sort of what what Heather and and Sarah were also saying is 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 that the real basics actually that really matter here that the 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 feeling in control and feeling listened to, being able to wash and eat and you know that that very basic level of, of of being looked after as a human being is 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 just seems to be so key and um yeah i i i i hear what you're saying rachel about this development you know we must all be more resilient but actually there are so many things that we can do aren't there that that will um that will that will help us just on that everyday basis um so fascinating thank you we've got a a couple of questions um, and comments uh, in the in the chat. So the first comes from Dwayne Meller, who asks, um, were any themes linked to spirituality identified, either religious or non-religious? So I don't know if any of you want to. Yes, Dwayne, I think. Yes. Um... Yes, they were. And I think explicitly by some in a religious sense, because there are a number of staff on the unit who, who are religious. But I think especially with that quote that I showed you about the connection to something bigger, I think that that de that denotes a sense of spirituality um, and feeling that we're not I suppose it's a sense of feeling that we're not alone, that we're we're in something bigger, and that we can, you know, get through this with these bigger, with this 
a bigger world around us. So if anybody else has anything more to say on that. I think just to maybe highlight um, a lot of people, our chapel is really beautiful and that people went there sometimes to pray, but actually it's just to have a space that was quiet and peaceful. And sometimes it's a chapel. Sometimes we have got a nice garden at work. And um, I suppose for me, sp space and peace feels like it's connected to that spirituality. Brilliant. Thank you. A comment from Steve Cam. Um, it's so important to listen to people, to pay attention to what they're going through and give them space to consider their current well-being state and what could make them feel better. So it's a comment, not a question, but if you want to respond to that at all. Yeah, it's so difficult as well to have the time to listen to people when a paediatric intensive care especially is it's just such a busy place and finding those moments actually to have that time to be able to give to people and give them the right time and the right listen without distraction is is really really important um and sometimes that requires that i can't listen i can't hear you right now i'm busy clinically but let's set aside some time and there are ways to make people feel heard without actually having to do it in the moment if that isn't appropriate because of other things so definitely being listened to is and and being heard I was just thinking of our debriefs, Rachel, which our psychologists have been holding, the, which um, would be more, I suppose, what's termed as a cold sort of debrief, but that's all about holding space for people to be heard and sense-making. And I suppose if you look at all the moral injury type work, it, it is because people are struggling to make sense of what's happened. So that holds a space for them to do that. So they set aside an hour. They've been, um, there's a podcast, Oh dear, I think we've lost Rachel. Passed on the Learning for Excellence oh, website we from one. Oh, sorry. I was just saying there's a podcast from one of our psychologists on the LFE site about it and also making it practical. She talks a lot about, you know, probably traditionally with psychologists, you have to commit to the hour, but actually trying to make it practical so people can dip in and dip out. They can use the chat, they can have their camera off. And trying to make something that's not traditional but fits and it gives something to the staff do you find um that 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 kind of um need for psychological support is more recognized after a a traumatic event or something that has happened in in the in the unit rather than the kind of general everyday um, fatigue that must come from working in such an intensive space is it is it kind of more do people sort of accept or, or are more ready to to seek that that more um, I suppose formal uh, type of, of well-being initiative when something mm. has happened rather than the kind of day-to-day -day grind of, of of just working in that in that kind of very stressful environment I think we're very good at recognising when something traumatic big like that happens. So we recognise and support. But sometimes actually the day-to-day -day grind, sometimes it's the thing that fills up your bucket more. And so actually regular debriefs and catch-ups with people can scoop up that kind of day-to-day -day rather than just, the, oh, they just witnessed a traumatic cardiac arrest or a sad death we're ready for that not ready for those but we're prepared for that afterwards but the day-to-day -day things are the things that catch your breath that you uh, that i think can knock you off your feet without you being aware and and i think that's very important that they're the things that can cause a moral injury as well i i agree with sarah i think that she's used the, sort of these two words together and i think that sometimes you know, it's really good to be able to listen, whether it's one-to-one -one or whether it's a listening to you type of debrief, which is um, what Rachel was referring to. Um, but I think that also in terms of um, uh, developing our own uh, coping strategies, understanding ourselves, um, that actually we also do prepare as well. So um, we do some simulations about how does it 
feel to be involved in these really difficult situations and um, and so that that allows people to explore those experiences within a safe, safe place so therefore um, they're better prepared um, for when those events do happen and so we we do we prepare better almost better for the for the for the severe events um, the critical events and um, and so what we need is 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 more than one thing and um, uh, and so yeah I think I think that the key message is, is there's so much that we can do uh, today uh, with our teams that can make it better is that we don't need to wait until we've got a hundred thousand pounds in order to be able to do it there is so much that we can actually do today um, just by opening up that conversation sorting the quick wins and then working consistently towards a more formal longer term plan um, going up through the steps and that's a that's a really positive outcome isn't it of, the, of this project that there are some real practical practical and, and cheap things that can be done in that short term we've got a few more comments um, coming up in the chat so uh, William Day thanks for such an interesting talk really hope that as we move back to some sort of normal trust can foreground staff well-being themes around nature and having time to escape work environments I can really see how social prescribing might work well as a way of creating and allowing individuals to take time away from work and then he finishes by saying how open do you think trust would be to engaging with material changes to working practices such as changes to shifts or more days off etc i think um uh, it's a good comment and a good question it sort of relates to policy and i really do feel that well-being is coming to the forefront and COVID has helped us with that um, and uh, the NHS has been so uh, has, has seen so much kindness and gratitude um, uh, as well as uh, we have also seen a lot of stress and difficult times um, but I think that the combination of those two things has meant that you know the, the governing bon bodies and the policy makers are really starting to prioritize well-being but at a, at a ground level, what we really need to do within our teams is to make sure that we have the right culture to allow that to flourish. And so um, you can't just do everything by top-down funding and policy. You really do need to have a culture of kindness and gratitude and compassion um, in order to make these sort of changes work. Thanks, Heather. Any other comments on that theme? Okay, we have a um, another question from Dwayne. The material changes are needed. There are also some challenges within the health professions of a drive almost to self-sacrifice for their patients and almost a stigma about taking breaks and time out. Does that resonate with any of you? Definitely, and I think that that goes back to what Heather's saying um, regarding culture, and it's about changing the culture, and that isn't just top down; it, it's throughout. So you know, when you go into work, say to the next team, "How was your day? Did you get a break?" And it, these are small things, but I agree. I think I think I've worked in the NHS for twenty two years, and sort of 10, 15 years ago, it was very much like all oh, taking a break, cheating type thing and, and I definitely agree but I I think that that culture is changing and now we're very much when we go on a night shift we have a little huddle and say right who's having which break well, let's try and accommodate breaks and I think we have sleep pods and you know it's there's lots of people doing research on sleep on on breaks all of this stuff means that the culture is changing um, and that's that sort of thing is the only way that it will So that's another hopeful and positive message, isn't it? <laughs> that, that, that this culture change is possible. Um, 
A comment from um, E. Nishimura. Thank you for organizing this talk. BCT, I'm guessing that means behavior change techniques, very timely, um, and how to apply it in the real world. And I, I guess that's the challenge for all of, of us psychologists, isn't it? How to how to translate the, what we know about behavior change techniques into actual behavior changes. <laughs> that's the challenge. What would you say about that, Rachel? <laughs> Making that step from <laughs> understanding through to intervention. I think that's that's the challenge that yeah will ever be, isn't it, for psychologists, like you say. Um, but the importance is about recognition, I think, and giving people ownership over the changes that they make. I think if if we believe ourselves that something is going to make us feel better, then we'll do it. Um, if it if it feels like a kind of a tokenistic. Um, offering then it kind of backfires and so I think what I've always thought is that we need to help give people opportunities to help them experience what our target behavior is in this case to, to have better well-being um, and then having that lived experience of it will strengthen their resolve to, to make sure that they get that sense again and so it's the, the recognition through lived experience of, of knowing how it feels and knowing how how good it, it can be <laughs> that will make the difference. So it's getting as many people as we can in, involved um, in developing interventions, making sure that we work together to co-produce our interventions and to make sure that we're having conversations all the way through with levels of staff from all over the unit to make sure that everybody is considered as well. Thanks, Rachel. Um, and I guess that that idea of, of of awareness and the experience of well-being is 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 um, really simply but fundamentally helped by that. You know, what what does well-being mean to you? As you've already said, that understanding of well, how does it feel when you when you are feeling like that? What or what triggers that? And yeah, I can I can see that 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 working really effectively because we don't stop and think about that unless someone asks us, do we? Okay, I think we've got time for one more question. This is from Steve Cam. How else is the research being shared, please? A local hospital to us has removed all the tea bags from the wards as there was a complaint about staff drinking tea on duty. Oh dear. I've read you a similar thing. Yet. Oh, sorry, sorry, Rachel. You go ahead, Rachel. We did go through a similar thing on our unit a few years yeah, ago. Yeah. We used to have a tea and cake trolley at night, and it was removed because it was felt to be unprofessional to be drinking. I don't know who come up with this, but I suppose we've much now moved back to having it, and the feedback of that has been um, through this study and other ways. Is actually it's not all about the cup of tea, but that might be the only person in your day that says how are you that doesn't want something from you who's just saying, so we've had volunteers in, and it's really powerful. And also it creates a space in our unit to sit with the parents. And I had a friend that was on the unit a few years ago, and she said it was a favourite time of the day because the nurse used to just sit down and you just chat about normal stuff during that tea round. And so I suppose going back to Rachel's things where we actually put in the sort of the psychology behind it, there's actual psychology to having tea rounds and a psychological basis. Absolutely. And, and Steve also asked, where will the research be shared? So we are working like busy bees in the background to get our papers finished and submitted for publication. And so we'll be tweeting galore once they come out and making sure that they're available for everybody to read. Okay, that's fabulous. Thank you all so much for your participation. Thanks to our audience for their questions. Thanks to all of you, uh, Rachel, Heather, Sarah and Rachel for your um, contribution to this um, lecture. Um, it's very much appreciated and wish you uh, the very best of luck in the continuation of this research project. So you can um, uh, access this recording afterwards on uh, our YouTube channel on the Aston Originals YouTube channel. And if you follow us at Aston IHN on Twitter, um, you'll be able to hear more about our other Molecules to Minds lectures that are coming up. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.